Well, good morning, everyone, distinguished governors, distinguished uh, members of the board of directors, friends, invited guests. Wonderful for you to be here. Uh, maybe if we can just take our seats, it's 8.30, so we'll probably get started. Um, as my colleague Doug will explain in due course, uh, we do have kind of a hard stop at 9.30 so that people can get to the uh, opening session um, given security, so we'll definitely be wrapping up on time. So with that, let me just say good morning. Again, very nice to see uh, a very full room here. Thank you very much for coming during your busy schedules. My name's Tom Clark. I'm the general counsel of the bank. Um, as many of you know, uh, this is a little bit historic. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, you know we're all uh, founding fathers or mothers uh, at a very important moment for ADB, the first time in its nearly 60-year history that we are amending our charter. You know, many of our peers, like the World Bank, the EBRD, have had several charter amendments. This is the first time for us. And so we really appreciate, um, as you've been working with us on this process, um, I think it's something that is very much consistent with a lot of the direction and guidance coming out of the G20. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I just want to really express on behalf of, of the bank management and OGC our, our gratitude um, for all of your support in driving the process forward and your attendance here this morning in, in such numbers uh, uh, on a very busy Saturday morning, which I, I think attests to, to the interest that you all have in this important process. So thank you very much. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Assistant General Counsel Doug Perkins uh, to uh, walk us through the presentation. Thank you. Doug, over to you. Great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, again, thanks. Uh, very glad to see so many people here this morning um, uh, to, to hear about where things stand um, in the process that we're following uh, in relation to the removal of the uh, charter lending limit um, from the ADB charter. Um, as Tom alluded to, uh, just a quick announcement before we get started, and, and it's that those of you who are wishing to attend the opening session um, of the annual meeting must arrive by 10. Uh, so we intend to complete uh, this at by 9.30 sharp, um, if not a bit earlier. Um, I understand that buses will be available outside and there'll be ushers uh, showing you the way. So um, once we wrap up, please do, uh, 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 I guess don't linger, please please go ahead and follow the ushers and move on outside so that you can get to the uh, the concert hall, I believe, where it's being held at um, promptly. Um, I'm just going to give a, we're going to do a, a short presentation, maybe 20 minutes, uh, but the intention is that um, after that, um, we open up the floor for any questions that you might have. Um, we're obviously always available um, through email and otherwise, uh, conference calls to, to answer any questions, but you know, we did want to leave the bulk of the time today to, to any questions you might have. Um, before I get into the, to the presentation, um, I, I wanted to just quickly remind everyone um, why we're amending the ADB charter in the first place. So um, uh, for those of you who might have forgotten by this point, um, since we're just now just dealing with the process, but um, in 2022, um, under the Italian G20 presidency, the, the G20 formed an independent expert panel to make various recommendations to maximize the impact of the existing capital of the, uh, of the MDBs. Um, and as you know, we've been implementing many of those uh, uh, suggestions over the past couple years. Um, it's been a very busy time on the, the, the finance side of things um, uh, within the MDBs, um, as some of my colleagues know quite well. Um, one of the G20 expert panel recommendations was to remove the nominal lending limits um, that are included in the charters of all the MDBs. Um, and these are essentially hard limits on the overall lending that MDBs uh, are, are, able to, um, are, are able to extend. Um, they are, I think, would be considered quite simplistic uh, and they no longer really reflect uh, the best practices in determining capital adequacy. Um, ADB has its own uh, board approved capital adequacy framework. It was just updated um, towards uh, the end of, uh, towards the second half of last year. We think it's state of the art and we think it reflects probably the best uh, means to ensure that ADB remains uh, well capitalized. And so in many ways, the, uh, the charter lending limit um, in, uh, in the ADB charter is, is not really um, fit for purpose any longer. 
um, at least not the way it's currently formulated. So um, ADB's nominal lending limit is set out in Article 12.1 uh, of the ADB Charter, and we're proposing to remove this provision from the Charter in its entirety. Um, other MDBs, uh, including EBRD and IBRD, um, are also in the process of amending their charters uh, to remove uh, their respective lending limits. Um, so uh, we're definitely working in concert or, or, or uh, in parallel with um, our peers at the other MDBs. Now, in terms of the legal requirements for amending the ADB Charter, um, this is set out in Article 59.1 of the ADB Charter. Um, it's a relatively straightforward provision, and what it provides is that the Charter can be amended by a resolution of the ADB Board of Governors, approved by a vote of two-thirds of the total number of governors, uh, that, that would be 46 of the, of the 68 governors, representing not less than three-fourths or 75% of the total voting power of the members. So, um, as Tom mentioned, even though we've been, uh, the ADB has been uh, in existence since 1966, this is the first time we've ever pro proposed to amend the ADB Charter. So we've had to think quite a bit about the process and procedures to be followed um, for amending the charter. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's been a lot of work and, and thought that's gone into this. The one thing I would mention um, is the Inter-American Development Bank actually has a very similar amendment provision to what we have in our charter. So we've um, spoken to them and we're generally following the process that they established for when they've amended their charter previously. The EBRD um, and IBRD, the amendment provisions of their charters, interestingly, are written differently. Um, it, their process, you know, I mentioned earlier that under ADB's charter, the Board of Governors, uh, as soon as a supermajority or, you know, uh, two-thirds representing three-quarters of the total voting power have approved it, then, then the, uh, the amendment is approved. Whereas at EBRD and IBRD, the Board of Governors will first vote on the amendment and then it gets submitted to the, to the members um, for it to be um, approved, um, essentially. So the, and then the members, by a supermajority, have to come back and confirm that they have um, uh, essentially approved by following their domestic processes. So it, ours is a bit of a reverse process where the, the Board of Governors is actually the final step and, and not the first step, as is the case with EBRD and IBRD. So. Um, First, let me just go through the process that we've developed for amending the ADB Charter, um, and I'll show you the time frame that, that we're kind of looking at for the moment uh, for, for um, completing uh, the process, and then I'll update everyone on, on kind of where we stand in terms of the feedback that we've gotten from governors um, based on the re reply forms we've asked everyone to fill out and, and to submit back to us. Um, so I think a lot of you will probably have been involved back in the capitals in, in helping, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking into the requirements in each of your countries to, to, to how you would approve that domestically, the, the proposed amendment. So we received back uh, many reply forms, and so I'll update you on, on where we stand on those. Okay. So the, we have a two-stage process that we're following, and we're currently in stage one. Um, so in October of 2023, uh, the Board of Directors approved the submission of report to the Board of Governors requesting that each governor consult with its capital to determine and take any prior necessary government actions, whether it be legislative, executive, or others, um, to enable the governor to subsequently vote on the governor's resolution. So we submitted with that report um, uh, a draft resolution um, that reflects what the governors will eventually be required to vote on. So um, the actual report that the Board of direct, uh, Directors um, approved was sent out to the Board of Governors uh, on the 7th of November, and we've given the governors one year, um, that is until 7 November of this year, to have their capitals complete the necessary domestic steps so that the governors can vote on the amendment. Um, We've requested the governors to inform ADB when the domestic steps have been completed through submission of a, a governor reply reform um, that was attached to the, to the report that was sent out. And over the past uh, several months, basically since, uh, I guess starting from the end of last year, we've been slowly receiving the, these completed reply forms 
um, from from uh, from the uh, from the governors, and I'll, I'll discuss the current status of these forms in a in a couple slides. Okay, okay. For stage two, so um, as mentioned, we we essentially need. Uh, we, we need two-thirds of the total number of governors representing three-quarters of the total voting power uh, in order to approve the amendment. So once we've heard back from governors you know, through these reply forms that they will be in a position to vote on the amendment, um, then we will proceed to stage two. And what will happen then is the board of directors will uh, ap approve um, management's recommendation for the Board of Governors to cast their vote on the governor's resolution. So we've submitted a draft resolution just so that each of the capitals know what exactly the governors will eventually be voting on um, as part of doing your domestic process. But at this stage two, the Board of, uh, the board of Directors will actually formally uh, uh, recommend to the Board of Governors to cast their votes on the actual, uh, uh, on the resolution um, that will remove uh, Article 12.1. Um, so again, we, we before we go to this step, we want to know that we have the threshold amount. And I think we, we're probably actually going to want to go a little bit beyond that because, you know, there could be changes in governments for a couple of the, the members at that time, the, the governors, you know, uh, you know, some governors might be, uh, you know, through, through uh, there might be transition periods where some governors can't vote um, because of changing governments. There could be other situations. So I think we're not going to go back to the governors when we just have the bare minimum. I think we'll want a certain amount of, of uh, buffer on that before we go and ask people to formally vote um, to avoid the possibility that, that some of the governors might not be in a position to, to vote. So, um, so then the Board of Governors will, will vote on that. There's a, um, by special procedure under the bylaws, so that's a, a vote outside of the context of a formal uh, Board of Governors meeting. Um, uh, the Board of Directors will, will specify uh, what the actual period will be um, when, when they uh, make the recommendation to the Board of Governors. Um, and then once we've heard back uh, from the, the necessary threshold, uh, of governors to approve the amendment, will um, uh, ADB will send an official communication uh, address to all the members informing them that it has been approved. Um, and then the effectivity under the charter, uh, the, the uh, amendment will take effect three months after the date of the official ADB communication to all the members unless the Board of Governors specify a, a different period. Okay, so the indicative time frame. So again, we're in stage one now. The report went out in November of 2023 to the Board of Governors, um, asking them to go ahead and uh, consult with their capitals to take the necessary domestic steps um, to enable them to eventually vote on the resolution. And then in stage two, um, again, we're, we're hoping, we've given governors a year to, to, to uh, work with their capitals to complete the domestic processes. Um, if necessary, that can be extended. We're hoping not to, uh, that we won't have to. Um, but if necessary, what we would do is we, as we approach November 7th, if it looks like there won't be enough, um, that we won't have enough uh, votes by that time, then we can go, management can recommend to the board of directors to extend that period uh, you know, for an additional, you know, whatever it looks like that we might need in order to, to uh, secure the necessary um, vote um, from the governor. So, so that's to be determined, but um, I think ideally for stage two, if, if we do get the necessary indication that, that uh, we have the, the threshold by, um, by November, then, I can, then we probably will go to the board uh, the board of management will go to the board of directors t towards the end of this year uh, to request them to go ahead and approve the submission of the formal resolution to the board of uh, governors. So that is something that the, the voting would probably actually take place probably, I, I'm guessing, early next year. Uh, and then, you know, if all things go well uh, uh, in terms of the voting, then perhaps middle of, of the, uh, the year it'll actually come into effect. Um, so that, that's what we're looking at, uh, at probably best case scenario. Okay, in terms of the feedback that we've received to date, um, again, we've been asking governors to fill out these governor's reply forms and submit them back to us, and we've been receiving those uh, since the end of last year, um, little by little. 
Um, and, and the reply form basically asked a couple, uh, two things. One is to indicate uh, by checking these boxes what what's the nature of the um, approval that's necessary within each of the you know with, within the uh, the relevant member, so legislative or executive or other action. Um, and then we've also asked to confirm whether um, the governor would be prepared to vote uh, on the amendment um, by 7 November of this year. Um, thus far, uh, the, the, the re uh, reply forms, we, they keep coming in. Um, I think having this meeting today and knowing this was going to be a topic perhaps uh, incentivized some governors to, to go ahead and get back to us quickly on this, so we, we very much appreciate that. Um, uh, but as of today, we've heard back from 38 governors um, as of 3 May. Um, 33 governors representing uh, approximately 67.6% .6 of the total voting power of ADB have expressed their readiness to vote on, on the uh, resolution before um, by 7 November 2024. Um, three governors will only be able to vote in 2025, or that's what they've indicated to us, and then two other governors have indicated that they would be unable to provide the requested information until ADB initiates the formal voting process. So they, they can't take prior action in terms of the domestic approvals until they actually get the, the, um, the resolution, uh, the formal, formally submitted resolution to their governors. Um, yeah. So um, just, just uh, the, I think we'll get there on the threshold, probably in you know, fairly quick fashion. Um, we're, we're at 67.6 .6 now, we need 75, um, so we're getting close. Uh, where we're, we're falling a bit short at the moment is the, um, the, the number of governors that have to vote in, pro, uh, uh, in favor of it. So two-thirds of the total number of governors is 46, and so we're currently at 33 um, who can vote for it. So we, we, you know, we're still waiting to hear back from uh, uh, 30 governors, so you know, we'll get there, I, I, I'm, I, uh, hopefully soon, but, but, but that's the one area where it looks like we're gonna need you know, some additional uh, um, feedback from governors so that, so that we can um, ensure that we've, we've met that, uh, that prong of, the, of the, uh, the threshold. So, but we're getting, I think, I think we're farther along at this point than we were um, really anticipating. But um, for those of you who have submitted, thank you very much. Um, I imagine there was a lot of work that had to go on within the capitals. Um, but, um, but uh, and we really appreciate the efforts on that and the questions that we've gotten to date. For those of you who have not yet, you know, please do um, uh, submit uh, the completed reply form. Uh, again, there's about 30 who haven't yet. Um, so, you know, we would encourage you to please um, uh, get back to us as soon as you can. We have heard from some people saying they're still going through their, their processes internally and consulting with the necessary uh, departments or, or ministries internally, but um, uh, so, uh, but for those uh, for for those of you who are uh, have not yet submitted again, we we look forward to hearing back from you, and and uh, I'm sure we will be uh, uh, following up with you over the the, the coming months to uh, um, see where things stand on that. So um, yeah, so that's that's where we're at the moment, and um, again, happy to answer any questions that that people might have, and and. Uh, um, so please uh, feel free to let us know. Doug, thanks. And, and just before opening up for quiet, by the way, I hope you weren't suggesting we were like threatening to name and shame people uh, who didn't uh, get, get their stuff in on time. But not, not at the moment. Okay. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much. Just before opening up for questions, uh, I, I just wanted to say, as Doug mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, this is obviously something that's deriving from a lot of the work that the G20 has done, looking uh, more broadly at optimizing our balance sheets, of which, you know, removing this, frankly, you know, antediluvian provision um, is, is a very important part. But there are other parts as well, including, you know, our approval uh, late last year of a new capital adequacy framework. And, and in all of this, and within this holistic effort to improve our balance sheet, I just would be remiss not to acknowledge that it's really been a 180B effort. And uh, we've worked very closely with our dear colleagues from, uh, from the Treasury Department and from the Risk Department. I just want to, you know, uh, acknowledge, uh, you know, the presence here and support of this 
presence of our Vice President, Roberta Casali, for risk and finance. And I, I see my dear colleagues, our Head of Risk, Stephen O'Leary, and our, our Treasurer, Pierre Van Pietingham, and, and Assistant Treasurer, uh, Tobias Hawkshire in the audience. And it's, it's really been, you know, a very, uh, I'd like to say, 180B effort as we look at, you know, optimizing our balance sheet uh, consistently with the G20 uh, directives. Um, anyway, with that, uh, let me turn it back to you uh, to open it up. Yeah, ju just one more thing to mention. It, um, it, it is mentioned in the report that was submitted to the Board of Governors where we asked you to take the, uh, uh, go ahead and consult, consult with your, your, within the capitals to take the domestic steps. But we are, um, and I think the intention is that within this year we would, um, uh, we would be looking to, uh, I, I guess it would be an amendment to our capital adequacy framework to include a replacement for this nominal limit that's currently in our charter um, and, and includes some alternative form of a, of a lending limit in the, in the capital adequacy framework itself. That was one of the things that the board of directors um, had indicated was uh, uh, s still something of interest. So th the current nominal lending limit in our charter is a one-to-one -one, uh, lending limit, um, which again is, is, um, is something that I think everybody considers to be um, uh, too tight or, 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 or not um, a, an appropriate uh, uh, lending limit ratio for, for um, a bank like ADB, including, uh, including because just we, we, the capital adequacy framework has means to ensure that we're properly uh, risk-weighted means to, to ensure that we're uh, properly uh, uh, adequately capitalized. But there is um, an intention to submit, I, I think, first a working paper and then receive feedback from the board, and then uh, finally a, a final paper that will uh, suggest an alternative uh, form of, of lending limit. So that, that is something that's in the works, and, and I, I believe, Stephen, something that, that's the intention that uh, within this year would be submitted to the board of directors so that they can consider that as, a, as an alternative to what's currently in the charter. The one benefit of, of having something like that in the, as part of the capital adequacy framework is that it can be easily amended in the future if it's ever necessary to do so. Um, you know, rather than have to go through this whole process of going back to the Board of Governors, we can simply, through the Board of Directors, um, revisit that and amend it uh, as necessary based on a board of the Board of, uh, of Directors. So um, again, that's, that's an important element uh, to this whole exercise. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, so again, if, if anyone has questions, just raise your hand, and I, I think uh, my, my colleagues from uh, the Secretary's office can uh, hand you a microphone. Uh. Thank you very much, DJ Clark, for this meeting, and thank Doug for the uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, I think it's great to hear that uh, 38 members uh, uh, responded to the survey, and uh, yeah, uh, that gave us some uh, certainty uh, on the process. So, uh, from uh, the board, we do hope that uh, you know the management, the OGC, you continue to consult with those members who have not yet provided their uh, response, so that we can have a clearer understanding, yeah, on the way forward. Then I have one question. You know, you said 33 uh, members have provided their response. So did they say after you know ADB initiated the uh, process, how long they will need to cast their vote? Thank you. So we didn't ask. Uh, we didn't ask them how long they would need to vote. I think the 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 intention is that uh, again. I, I mentioned earlier. So the board of directors will um, uh, will decide how long a period to give the board of governors uh, to vote on the resolution. So I think that pr probably what we'll do is. Uh, um, we, we have some who have come back to us and indicated that they would, uh, that their board of, uh, of go that their governor would be prepared to vote by November 7th. Some people have indicated that they might need um, some period of time to go through a domestic process, another process after they've actually received the resolution. Um, and, uh, and so I think what we will likely do is We'll, we'll, we'll gauge where we're at in terms of the thresholds and take into consideration those countries who've indicated 
that they might need a, to go through a certain domestic process once they've received the actual formal resolution um, before they, they um, an additional domestic process before they can vote. And then I think that will probably be built into the board of directors um, a recommendation or, or their, their, their formal submission to the board of governors will be that, will take into account as part of the period of time for the, for the governors to vote perhaps some of these uh, uh, some of these feedback that we've received from the from the capitals about needing a certain period of time to to go through a certain process so um, at this point in time it's not clear how much time we might need but certainly we will have further consultations to, to see whether some members might need a couple months or three months to, to, to complete that process as part of the, the actual uh, formal voting period on that. So yeah, we'll, we'll certainly um, keep that in mind and, and um, in, as part of the management's recommendation to the board in terms of the period of time that the Board of Governors should be given to vote on it. So. They've said they can do it by November 7th, although, you know, each country has a, a they, they have their own, you know, requirements. And so there might be, we do understand that a couple countries, once the formal submission's been made to them, they still might need a certain amount of time in order to take a couple of other steps uh, in, in, domestically. So, you know, it may be the case that we give three months um, for the formal voting for the Board of Governors um, so that uh, those couple countries that have indicated they need, they need to take some steps, uh, you know, that they can do so. So I, I think that's what we're, um, something we'll have to take into consideration when we set that voting period. Yep. Good morning. Uh me, Yasam Zakaria Hawk, I work as additional secretary in the Economic Relations Division of Bangladesh. <clears throat> um, one proposal from me, I think that uh, uh, if you can give some projection or some clear idea about the opportunities will be created uh, if uh, this removal happens, like uh, it will expand the you know, lending capacities of ADB, I understand how member countries will be benefited, in what ways, what will be the impacts on the cost of borrowing. It would be uh, uh, convenient for uh, making countries more engaged with the concept. So that is uh, one proposal from me. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thanks for the question. So when we went to the board of directors to ask uh, the board to approve moving ahead with uh, the amendment um, and the submission to the board of governors um, uh, as part of the first stage this was an important question and that, that was whether or not amending the charter might have an impact on on uh, the cost of, of adb's fundraising since we're removing this uh, this clause from the charter so some might say that that might um, uh, could potentially, in theory, create a point of concern with uh, investors in ADB bonds or something that might, you know, cause the, our our lending, uh, what, what ADB borrows at to go up. I, I think it's been very clearly understood um, and based on consultations with, with investors and the credit rating agencies that this has no impact um, on what it costs ADB to uh, lend. I, I think what, as, as I understand it, uh, there's other experts here uh, better than me to talk about this, but that um, the credit rating agencies don't really consider this uh, lending limit and, and, and rating ADB, um, and it's not something that I think that we, we're quite confident that investors um, take into consideration and, and that it would have any impact whatsoever on, on what it costs ADB to, let, to borrow and, and in turn what it will, you know, what we will lend at to our members. So I think that's been very clearly understood and, and um, so it should, it should have no impact whatsoever. In terms of the benefits, um, there's a very clear benefit which is that um, as we, um, ADB has been tasked with um, providing greater and greater levels of support to its member countries, including for climate, uh, most importantly for climate um, operations, that this lending limit will not um, actually cause us to, uh, to constrain or to limit our operations in the future. 
Um, I think under current projections by 2029, um, we will bump up against this lending limit in the charter. And since it's in the charter, um, we have to comply with it, um, uh, absent amending the charter to remove it or to, you know, to, to change it. So um, that would mean we would actually have to start curtail lending um, in order to, um, to stay within that charter lending limit uh, threshold on our, uh, on our overall uh, financing operations. So it's very important that we be able to, um, uh, given the fact that we're foreseeing uh, hitting that limit in the, in the next you know, uh, four or five years that, that we take the steps now to, to remove this and if necessary, uh, you know, have an alternative in, as part of the capital adequacy framework um, so that it doesn't become a constraint on our operations, um, particularly now at a critical time where we need to be providing more and more support to our members, uh, you know, to deal with climate and, and other um, crises that we've experienced in the last several years. Hope that answers your question. Anything else? Well, you know, I, I, I love quoting movies, Doug, so I, I have to quote, you know, one of my favorite movies. Oh, is there a question? Is there a question? Oh, please, go ahead. No worries. It's very uh, quite technical. Thank you, Kaiser Heckler from the Finnish delegation. Just on the procedures, uh, uh, I'm interested in the timetable of the, the, the paper on the alternative uh, limits and when can we expect that, and also the final resolution. When do, you, when do we expect to sort of see the... Or is it uh, the draft uh, text, basically? Uh, thanks. So, so Stephen, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe a working paper will be submitted by management to the board. So a working paper is a proposal to the board of directors on the alternative lending limit. I believe within the, the second or third quarter, third quarter of this year, sorry, um, a working paper will be submitted to the board of directors with, with a, a proposed alternative uh, lending limit um, feedback will be obtained and then I think by the end of the year fourth quarter by the end of the year the taking into the feedback uh, of the board of directors then the final paper will be submitted to the board uh, for approval um, the the board has been quite keen that before and I, I guess this it's a sequencing question you, that you're asking that this alternative be in place before the actual um, charter amendment is actually um, uh, becomes effective, and so um, the, I think I, I mentioned at the uh, during my during the uh, going through the slides. I think best case scenario, the formal submission, um, assuming by you know November of this year, um, we've heard back from governors meeting the threshold uh, to to vote on the the amendment. I think best case scenario is that probably early uh, uh, 2025 that there will be a formal submission to the Board of Governors requesting them to vote on the, the resolution. And then as mentioned uh, under the charter, uh, you know, there was a, there was a question, there, there will probably be a, uh, probably a couple month voting period perhaps, maybe two or three month voting period in which governors can vote on it and get back to ADB. Um, and then once, once ADB has certified that the threshold has been met, then it's only another three months after that certification that it would actually become effective. So we're probably looking at mid-2025 earliest before the amendment would actually take effect. So yeah, so the, the actual alternative should come into place. Um, uh, and, and I think when we, do, if the board of directors approve on an alternative, it'll, it'll likely be uh, presented subject to the eventual approval of, of the actual amendment itself, so it would take effect upon that. Um, we still have to discuss that internally, but that's probably how it'll work. But, but yeah, the, the, the actual board of directors voting on that should come before the actual amendment of the charter itself. Does that, is that what you're getting at? Okay. You had a story, Tom, you were gonna tell for the... Well, I just wanna make sure I don't get preempted again, so I'm gonna wait a long time and make sure there's no other questions, but um, yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Matsut Hashemi from uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, just a question regarding the decorum requirement. Could you please repeat it again? It's three, four, four. The decorum requirement. Yeah, yes, yeah. thank you. So it's two-thirds of the total number of uh, governors 
uh, representing th uh, th three quarters or 75% of the total voting power of the members. Yeah, and so as I mentioned, as of today, we have about 66, I believe, uh, percent of, of governors who've come back indicating that 66% uh, of the voting power of the, of the members have come back and said they'd be ready to vote by November 7th. I'm anxious to hear this now. This is uh... any other any other questions? Um, I, I just uh, you know, Doug, just uh, in, in in summing up, and I think there was an excellent uh, question from the gentleman over here that kind of comes back to how you began, which is you know why are we doing this uh, in the first place, and and what benefit? And I think as as Doug said, you know, the benefit is we'll be able to continue to lend, but you know, the real question is you know why is that so important? And I think you know the ultimate answer to your question. You know, uh, you know, certainly we can speak for ADB, but more broadly, I think, you know, the answer is contained in the G20 Independent Expert Group report that came out uh, almost a year ago now, the Triple Agenda. And when you read that, you know, you just see the existential nature of the development and climate and interlinked, you know, threats that we see around, you know, loss of biodiversity, development needs, climate. These are existential threats for our DMCs. And, you know, that report from the G20 clearly shows that we need to really up the game. And, you know, it's called triple agenda for a reason. They say that there needs to be incrementally 270 billion per year, incrementally to what we're doing now in additional lending from the IFIs and MDBs. You know, right now, collectively, we, the World Bank, our other peers, are lending about 135, 140 billion. That has to go up by 270. It has to be tripled. And then, of course, it has to mobilize additional private sector financing to the tune of an incremental three trillion a year, if we're going to take that seriously. All of which, I think, puts in context why this is important. You know, this charter change is certainly only a small down payment on how the system as a whole has to react to meet that existential threat. But, you know, we can start by doing what we can do. And what we can do here is to uh, amend the charter, to take that out of the way so that we don't have a hard stop to our lending. And the immediate benefit will be that we can see that path to increasing our financing in line with, you know, the G20 direction. So I, I guess just to conclude the way we started, uh, you know, this is something that you know, is critical, I think, for the G20, critical for, for us and our mission and for our developing member countries as we respond to the triple planetary threat that we, 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 we see every day out there. So my story was just going to be when I thought there were any questions, I was going to use my favorite story about Thomas More and, uh, you know, when uh, he, he's, uh, he's accused of not agreeing, you know, with the king's privilege because he wouldn't rise to support it. And he said, no, the maxim of the law is qui tacit consentiri. He was silent, should be deemed in law to agree to it. So I don't know if it would be too legalistic of me to say that if there isn't any opposition that is uh, vocally raised here, that there is some consensus among us that this is a good thing to do. And, uh, and I hope that that is the case and that, you know, with your strong support, um, you know, your, your countries will move forward to approve this amendment. It is critical and historic for ADB. And, and again, finally, I just want to say thank you so very much for your support in this process and, and moving forward uh, expeditiously so that we can meet that timeline, hopefully by November, hopefully won't need another extension and can get on with the business of helping our DMCs uh, deal with the existential threats they face. So thank you all very much for coming today. Really appreciate it. And safe travels to the next event. Thank you.